In this lecture, we are going to talk about uh, chromatography. In particular, we are going to talk about uh, liquid chromatography because uh, we know we are studying this module, batch process pharma <laughs> engineering. So, we are going to deal only with liquid chromatography. We will not learn anything about gas chromatography. In pharmaceutical industries, uh, liquid chromatography is one of the most widely used technique. Uh, mostly, they use it for like a purification technique, or sometimes they like to separate uh, separate separate different components from a sample mixture. So you will learn about these things, and then in, in specific, we are going to learn about uh, elution chromatography. So elution chromatography is a uh, type of a chromatographic process so we will cover this in full detail and then so what we are going to see in this particular lecture is we are going to see a bit of history so we will know when when this word chromatography started in the scientific literature it, it, it dates back almost to 191903 so we will see a bit a bit of history of chromatography so and then we will see what's the main objective of this elution chromatography yeah? why we need to go for elution chromatography in order to purify a compound we already learned something about uh, liquid liquid extraction crystallization also even adsorption so why if, if we have all these techniques all these techniques are used in pharmaceutical industries mainly for separation of molecules from a from a sample mixture it can be from a solid phase or from a liquid phase and we will see why when we go for elution chromatography instead of crystallization or adsorption or liquid liquid extraction yeah. so these things we will cover in this lecture and then obviously we will see some like once we once we know how to perform an experiment and if you know what will be the experimental outcome you will automatically will understand what are the advantages and what's the limitations of this technique yeah? so i don't even want to call the disadvantages of this technique we can just say limitations so whatever that we we can call it as dis disadvantage that comes due to the limitation of of this experimental technique and then we will name the components like uh, once we know how to perform an experiment we will define some name name like a like a stationary phase a mobile phase elute element and so on yeah? so those things we will learn through this lecture and then we will look into the properties of the materials which we use in order to perform a separation using this liquid chromatography technique and then we will just uh, talk a bit about uh, some expected results if you perform an experiment in the lab how the results will look like you know? and then we will try to explain the experimental observation so we will draw some diagram that might that will look like some of the expected results and then we will try to explain the experimental observation and then we will let's go to the next page so then we will learn something about uh, theories or if you want just call something like scientific ideas so that will try that will help help us to explain the experimental observation yeah? and then I just put a note or something like here so chromatographic technique is you can read a handbook of chromatographic technique or chromatography chromatography for example but you will understand you will not understand anything you know, because it's such a complex process so if but once you perform an experiment if you know how to perform the experiment which solvent to use which solid to use then then you can you can understand this technique very easily yeah so this is a technique which you can learn better by doing some experiments so obviously we are we are not going to the lab but i will show how to perform the experiment and then wh what the experimental results will look like and how to interpret those values and then we will give some explanation and we will try to discuss the, the expected results using some chemical engineering concepts so whenever i mean chemical engineering concepts we already learned a bit in in adsorption i talked a bit about mass transfer diffusion 
and so on. So we will use those terminologies to explain the results that we get from a chromatography experiment. And then we will talk a bit about the parameters relevant to the chromatography. Like if you look into adsorption technique, we know what's the key important parameter like your initial concentration, your adsorbent mass, your reactor volume and so on. In liquid liquid extraction, you know what, what are the key parameters like solvent volume and then from the ternary phase diagram, you know when, when we can observe two different phases. So you have to put some right level of proportion in order to make the separation possible. So something like that in chromatography, we have to deal with some parameters like flow rate of the mobile phase or the, the properties of your solid phase and so on. So those things we will learn through in these lectures. And then we will learn, in particular, we, we will study in detail about retention time. This is a key parameter. So retention time, this is something like how much the, your molecule spend in the stationary phase. We will learn about these things. And then resolution. Resolution is something we care about. So whenever we talk about chromatography, we have to think about resolution. So if you do the experiment in the lab scale reactor or even in the or in industrial industrial scale column, the, the main objective is to improve the resolution of the separation, molecular separation. So those things we will study. And then we will also know how to improve, improve the performance in the sense how to improve the resolution of our separation of two compounds from a sample mixture. So those things we will learn. And then we will learn how to characterize, how to imagine if you have some, some stationary phase and some, some mobile phase, how to characterize the, the events which are happening between those two different phases. And then we will learn a bit about uh, theory of uh, chromatography. This is a must. If you don't know the theory of uh, chromatography, no matter how good you can you perform an experiment in the lab, you will have no clue what's happening at the end of the experiment. So you must know the theory of uh, chromatography. So it is absolutely must. You should learn through this module. And then we will uh, talk a bit about I will show some one simple expression, something related to the theory of chromatography. And this one simple expression will try to will try to help us to understand all the mechanistic events which is happening when you perform this chromatography experiment. And then we will do a bit of mathematics. Yeah? So whenever I say some simple mathematical expression, it will have some constant, some variables. So we will exploit that ex one single expression and then we will do some, some, some basic mathematics to solve few problems. And this is something very important. We will learn how to improve the separation resolution. Yeah? So at the end of the day, we go for chromatographic separation. Like if you have a sample and if your sample contains, say, A plus, B plus C, so they differ from each other in terms of molecular weight and, and also the chemical properties. So if you need to separate them, if you need to separate them using chromatographic technique, we should know, we should get a clear separation. Yeah? So at the end of the day, we should get 100% A, 100% B, 100% C. Yeah? So if this, this means this is a perfect uh, resolution so somehow we managed to separate all these three compounds using this particular or specific technique yeah so but but in many cases when we do an experiment we will get something like a 80 percent a plus 20 percent b or maybe 20 percent b plus 80 percent c or maybe 80 percent a plus 20 percent c so different combinations so so if if Normally we don't like this, so in this case we have to think about improving the the separation resolution until we reach, until we manage to get hundred percent pure product of each of these compounds A, B, and C using this technique. So that's what resolution is all about. 
and then we will use some chemical engineering concepts so so we will talk or we will think about or we will propose some ideas how to improve the resolution separation resolution purely based on chemical engineering concepts we will talk a bit about mass transfer we will talk about radial diffusion so something like a mass transfer in the radial direction mass transfer in the axial direction and then we will also try to talk a bit about the properties of the solids that we are going to fill in the chromatography column and so on and I think that's enough I think we should go to the topic so I already said to you what we are going to to learn in this lecture but always keep one thing in your mind so chromatography is a very very specialized topic yeah even in industries if they're going to if they need someone to work with this technique they will clearly mention in the job description we need a specialist yeah so they need someone with experience because there are so many things that goes into the into this particular process and for that you need some level of experience in order to understand everything about this technique this technique it's not a simple technique that you can learn you read two or three pages of the book and then you can you, you can start to interpret the experimental outcome or even make the setup and start to perform the experiment in order to separate some compound from a sample mixture you know? so so just remember this is a very specialized technique and then i said to you before explaining what what is the chromatography let's see a bit of a history so where it started so in 1903 a russian botanist his name is mikhail Svet. i don't know how to or Svet, i think i don't know how to spell his name he's a russian botanist so what he want to do is like uh, he want to separate pigments extracted from plants so in particular he want to separate carotenoids and chlorophyll so he want to separate these two compounds from the from a plant extract so that's his objective so what he did is like uh, he took a glass column he took a glass column he filled the column with the solid material some solid material and then he placed he placed the plant extract on top of this column he placed a plant extract on the top of this column so let's call this is say like a inlet inlet of the column inlet of the column or if you want we can call it is column inlet and then what he did <coughs> he started to to add He continuously added some solvent on the top of this column. This is a vertical column, by the way. You can do this experiment even by keeping your column in the horizontal direction. Sometimes we call it as a gravitational column. So what he did is like he added this solvent on top of this vertical column so what happened is like the this solvent can dissolve dissolve all the pigments in the plant extract which is placed at the top of the column or the column inlet so it dissolved these pigments in the plant extract and then it's the solvent helps to to transport transport those dissolved pigments through the solid phase and eventually it reaches the column exit somewhere in the in the bottom but what he observed he observed something very unique or, or specific he observed that this imagine if you start with uh, different molecules you have molecule one comma two comma three or if you want you can call pigment one pigment two and pigment three in this plant extract when what he observed 
each of these pigment they adsorb so they adsorb differentially onto this uh, solid material let's assume this material is adsorbent we can call it as solid adsorbent we already know what is an adsorbent how adsorption works we already covered it in the previous lecture so each of these compounds they adsorb differentially onto this solid mix in the into the solid particle which is filled filled in the column and always remember this we are continuously supplying the solvent yeah so there is some some amount of a flow rate it can be a very low flow rate but we are, we are feeding the solvent continuously which means we are continuously trying to push this pigment molecules from the top of your column to the bottom of your column using this particular solvent so and after some time what he observed he observed three different rings so one ring here second ring here and third ring here and each of these three rings corresponds to different pigments or different molecules say let's say this is one second ring to two and third ring to three so this is what he observed he observed different rings within the within the column within the column and each ring corresponds to different type of pigment molecules yeah? so this is the experimental observation so based on the nature of this out better on, sorry based on the, the the nature of the outcome of this experiment later this process was called as a chromatography so practically he managed to separate three compounds using this type of technique so so naturally the the molecule first one will comes out at the exit at the column exit you can collect them using a beaker and then the next beaker so once you finished collecting the compound one you collect the cell second pigment and then once you collected finished collecting the second pigment you collect the third pigment in the third vial so so this type of separation is possible because uh, the molecules they they adsorb differentially onto this uh, solid adsorbent and they move at a different speed or if you want a different time intervals so that's the main so that's the whole essence of this particular experiment so this is nothing but an illusion chromatography whatever the the, the experiment performed by Michael Sweat is nothing but illusion chromatography. Illusion chromatography. And if you want, we can give some name in terms of uh, something related to what we are learning at this moment. The solvent, it, it, it's not necessarily that it should be one particular solvent, say like acetone or water or isopropanol whatever yeah? it can be a mixture of solvent it can be a solvent mixtures it can be a mixture of water plus acetone or maybe water plus acetone plus isopropanol it can be a mixture of solvent and it can be the and the percentage of each solvent can vary from 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 near zero to hundred percentage yeah? so and we call this as a mobile phase the solvent which is continuously supplied on the top of the column is called the mobile phase and the solid particles which is which we filled in the column it's called as stationary phase stationary phase or if you want we can call even the mobile phase as eluvent eluvent and then so why we call it as eluvent yeah so okay let's come back to that later and then whatever the compounds that comes out carrying your so whatever the solvent or eluvent that comes out carrying the compounds which we need which we are trying to separate it's called as eluvate eluvate and then whatever the compounds that we are separating at the moment we call them as analyte 
if it's only one compound we call it as analyte say like analyte a or analyte b analyte c or if you have a mixture of compounds we can just call it as analytes yeah and normally your eluvate so eluvent will carry carry your analyte and then it will come to the bottom of your column so that's why we call it as eluvate sometimes we can even call it uh, like uh, the, 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 the molecule one elute first and then molecule two elute after after the molecule one and so on so these are some terminologies that you should remember when we are going to talk about chromatography you should know what is eluvent you should know what is eluvate you should know what's mean by analytes you should know what is a mobile face okay we call it as a mobile face because this is the one who is doing the job it's the one who is transporting transporting your your analytes from the top of the column to the to the column exit through the stationary phase where everything is happening everything in the sense separation is happening so try to remember these terminologies so based on the outcome of this experiment so what we what he observed is he observed three colored rings and obviously these three different colored rings corresponds to different molecules or pigments so based on this experimental outcome we call it as a chromatography so chroma means chromatography i have to go a bit slow because it's not an easy topic believe me chroma means color graphy means to write so at the moment it might look like uh, who cares about this history and all uh, and other things when we talk about this this whole process bit by bit you will try you will realize that everything will make a sense yeah so without knowing the basics there is no point in learning about the chromatographic theory or go to the advanced topic in this particular area so it's okay to learn the, the to or to know the history of this technique so that's the meaning the color and to write something like a color coding so and by the way the guy Mikhail Svet in Russia in Russian language sorry Svet also means color color so sometimes this process it's also few people they call it as especially Russians Svet's writing So in 1903, Mikhail Svart, he, he used, he filled the alumina and the calcium carbonate as the packing material. So in the column, what he filled, the solid he filled, is, is, they are mostly alumina and calcium carbonate. Both are very cheap materials. So this is the, this is the packing material which which he used but now almost every industry and almost every lab research lab around the world they use a silica silica is the is the workhorse for the liquid chromatography it's the workhorse for chromatography liquid chromatography or if you want always remember this word illusion chromatography i hope you all can follow up to this point sometimes the material we call this in purely chemical engineering term we just call it as a packing material i know you might have all read what's a packet bed how it works when you might have studied something related to absorption and also adsorption so silica is the packing material when whenever we think about liquid chromatography and uh, silica you know how what silica contains so silica mostly contains uh, two atoms uh, silica and uh, oxygen atoms mostly each silica is, is connected to one ox two oxygen atoms and then and so on So that's the the structure of uh, silica mostly and then maybe at the surface of the silica it might be exposed to some hydroxyl groups 
something like that so that's the that's a bit of chemistry mostly it contains three atoms silica oxygen and sometimes it's terminated by SiO O6 groups some hydroxyl groups in the surface so just to try to know this bit of uh, chemistry yeah so it have some electronegative atoms oxygen and it have silica and oxygen and it's one of the cheapest material that that you can get it's not an expensive material it depends on whether which type of quality you are targeting at if you synthesize this type of materials in the lab obviously it's going to become expensive you know and if you go to lab if you have some access to the lab and if you look for silica material mostly it, it looks like a, some white powder and that's the one we commonly use in chromatographic experiments and normally if you put it under a light microscope the especially the ones that we use in the in the lab and also in the industries they are mostly synthesized in the labs and they are mostly spherical particles if you put it under a light microscope you will see something like a beads something like like beads <coughs> and typically the size of these beads will be roughly five microns and sometimes it will be even less than this five microns so why are we talking all about these things it all will make sense because uh, I already said something about resolution so the main purpose of uh, doing the chromatography experiment is the is the res is to separate the compounds and uh, and we should have a better resolution yeah? so in order to achieve complete separation if we have a plus B plus C I already showed somewhere where is that somewhere here so if we have some three compound mixtures we, sh we should always look for some condition where we can get 100% pure compounds of A, 100% pure compound of B, 100% pure compound of C, or even if you have more than three compounds, still chromatography can do the job of separating these compounds from each other. So I hope you all can understand up to this point. So if you need to improve the resolution or, or, the, or the resolution of the this whole technique it all depends on even on the size of the particles yeah? so that's why we are talking about uh, what's the size of these beads and how it will look under microscope and so on yeah? and we also need uh, the shape of the particles it's also play a big role so this one we will we will learn when you are going to talk about uh, this eddy diffusion and or a longitudinal diffusion that will that we will cover either in this lecture or maybe in the next lecture so whenever we are going to talk about this AD diffusion I will try to to, to recollect uh, about the size and shape of the, the particles silica particles so you have to listen to this lecture only this lecture completely only then you will get some idea why we are throwing different piece of information randomly and then if you put if you put these particles under a electron microscope a very powerful electron microscope then you will see all these spherical particle will contain a very high amount of pores they are highly porous materials yeah? so they are not just some some spherical balls like a glass beads or not something like that no they will contain a lot of pores they will be interconnected these pores will be interconnected to to each other mostly and if you want to define something we call it as a porosity so porosity is like a, the whole volume of the sphere and then if if you know the volume of the the pores so if you take the like volume of the pores divided by the volume of the material itself bulk material so that will something give information about percentage porosity so typically these materials which we use in the lab and also the material which we commonly use in the industries so they are they're highly porous yeah so 
try to keep those uh, this this points in your in your mind so typically this porosity will range from say like roughly from 45 percentage to 55 percentage so keep these things in the mind so so the diameter of the particle is roughly around less than or equal to 5 microns and this whatever this post this size will typically range from 60 to 300 Armstrongs or if you want you can say you just divide by 10 in order to convert them into nanometers so roughly 6 to 13 nanometers so these are we call them as mesoports according to IUPAC classification anything in this range 6 to 13 nanometers we call them as in fact IUPAC defines 2 to 50 nanometers we call them as mesoports so obviously this silicon material contains a lot of pores and these pores typically range from 6 to 30 nanometers I think I explain reasonably well up to this point and also this 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 whatever you have the pores these pores are bounded by some surface so obviously you have some surface area so if you have a pore this pore is clearly bounded by surface on both sides so if we talk in terms of a surface area so normally every gram every gram of your silicon material or the packing material they will the surface area will be roughly range that range from 100 to 600 meter squared per gram it is possible to synthesize in the lab with surface area greater than this but most of the materials that we that are used as a packing material in the in the columns that we use in the lab or even in the industries we the surface area typically range from 100 to 600 meters squared per gram i hope so far all good then try to we just quickly mention like a when we go for chromatographic separation or when we go for chromatographic separation so we we all know like like liquid liquid extraction can do something similar job which is to to separate your compounds from a from a liquid mixture adsorption can separate a particular compound from a liquid to the solid side and then crystallization if you start from a solution you can eventually crystallize a pure compound and you know how these things work but when we go for chromatographic separation normally chromatographic separation is the last option we will think about if you need to purify some compound from your sample mixture so for example if, if you cannot crystallize a compound and every time when you crystallize some compound and if you man if you if you how do you call it, like if you can't get the pure product if the crystallized product is is a hundred percent it's not if <laughs> if the crystallized product if it's not hundred percent pure and if you don't know how to, if you cannot manage or if you cannot change the process conditions where you can achieve hundred percent pure product then we go for chromatographic separations yeah? so that's the whole idea just write it here so if we, if we cannot obtain obtain a pure product via crystallization then chromatographic separation will do the job So whatever this technique with the this experimental setup of Michael's sweat, 
we call this as a gravitational column we pour some solvent and then the solvent travels through the stationary phase and reach the column exit everything due to gravity yeah so we, we don't use any pump in the top of the column to pump your liquid from top of your column to the bottom of your liquid so practically there will be no pressure drop from top to bottom so but in high pre high performance chromatographic technique we will use uh, some pump which will allow which we can use to pump pump your solvent at a particular flow rate and obviously we can go we will have some heavy pressure drop something roughly around 50 to to 60 bars and if you and there, some of the advanced instrumentations which are available in many pharma industries it can even reach up to 100 to 120 bars and that's I hope you all understand up to this point so the main advantage is like uh, anyone can 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 work with this technique yeah? even if you don't have any theoretical knowledge on chromatographic technique if somebody gives you the, the set of procedures you can just go to the lab fill the solid material add the solvent add your add the compounds that you want to separate so it's a very easy technique to, to perform in the in the lab scale and also in the industrial scale and also the scale up scale up of the process is very simple all you need is to 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 increase the size of the column diameter and the length of the column but it's also very easy to to downscale the process as well just to change the the, the column height and the column width so so these are some of the some of the key advantages of uh, chromatographic technique and i know some of the students in this class already use this technique during their their core projects so for them this chapter might be easy i i believe they already know some of the terminology some of the theories and they i believe they also might have learned how to interpret the experimental outcome yeah? so for those students this this chapter will be a bit more easy i believe I'll just quickly remind the solid phase that we use is a stationary phase so these words you have to you know, to keep it in your mind and then the solvent which you're adding in the top is called mobile phase it's called mobile phase and then and it can be one solvent or it can be a solvent mixture it can be solvent mixture or a pure solvent we can use both but then at the end of the day whatever the mobile phase that we are adding it has to separate separate or compounds so that's the main purpose of using a solvent and also the solvent it, it also helps to mobilize mobilize the the compounds that that are needed to be separated and, and they are also in the in constant movement from top of the column to bottom of the column so So now we will try to to understand why we we get separation of separation of the molecules in such a simple setup so to understand is better let's let's do some experiments let's call it as a virtual experiment so we have to we have to do this in order to get some more understanding why the separation is happening in the stationary phase so this time what we will do is like let's take a three column so all we are going to do is the same type of experiment what Michael Sweat did so this time we are instead of one column we are using three different columns just assume all the columns have same same height same same width and so on and we fill it with some solid particles silica particles 
in all the columns just assume the silica particles that we are using they all have same properties like same surface area same porosity same particle size and so on you know? and let's assume we all fill these three column with same height say like a say 10 maybe 20 centimeter in all the, each of this column and then in each column we are going to place a different molecules so let's say we are going to fill in the top of the column with sample a and then in this one we fill this column with the molecule b sample b and then in the third column we will fill with sample c so this is your compound one this is your compound two and this is your compound three they have a different molecular structure which means they have different uh, molecular weight so and then we are going to add solvent in each of this column we are going to add the same same solvent say for example let, let's we are adding acetone for example we're going to continuously add acetone in the top of the the column and obviously it's going to and just assume acetone will dissolve all both all the three compounds a b and c and obviously their solubility will be different so solubility of a solubility of b solubility of c in the solvent will be different it's not going to be same so it will be different will be different but they can dissolve that's for sure so it's going to dissolve your compounds a b and c and then it's going to help to transport transport the molecules from top of your column to the column exit through the stationary phase and let's assume we have some clock some stopwatch that allows you to to <coughs> stopwatch and also we have a detector at the column exit say so let's have we have a detector it can be a simple uv probe so let's collect whatever that comes out of the column and then let's put the uv probe so this uv probe will tell what time will tell whether you have your compound a in the solvent you know? let's assume the solvent will elute first and then eventually it will carry your a and then after some time your a will elute together with your solvent so and we know with uv probe we know at <coughs> with uv probe we, we can check the concentration of your compound a and we can also check the concentration of b and we can also check the concentration of c in fact we we don't even have to worry about the concentration of c for the moment at least the purpose of doing this experiment is to know the time required for each of these molecules to reach the column exit together with the mobile phase so let's assume say like at time 10 when, when t is equal to 10 minute we observe the molecule a reach the column exit and say t is equal to 60 minutes molecule b reach the column exit and say like say like uh, somewhere around 80 90 minutes where molecule c reach the column exit so obviously it shows whatever the time that we see here now so this is something called as a retention time if you want to define retention time retention time we can define simply like uh, the time spent by the molecule in the stationary phase yeah? so that's nothing but retention time so in this case the retention time of molecule a is uh, 10 minutes in this case the retention time of molecule b is 60 minutes and then in this case the retention time of molecule c is 90 minutes so what we practically did is like uh, we are monitoring the time taken by the solute to reach the bottom of the of the column so if if these compounds a b and c are different molecules with different molecular weight and all of these molecules are soluble in the solvent then the time 
taken for each of this molecule to reach the end of the the column will be different yeah <coughs> and this and and why there is a huge time difference why that you have 10 minutes 60 minutes and 90 minutes so this means clearly the molecule a spent a very less amount of time in the stationary phase while your molecule c spent the a significant amount of time in the stationary in the stationary phase whereas your molecule b is lies somewhere in between molecule a and molecule c yeah? so it spent uh, roughly 60 minutes within the, the stationary phase and and this simple experimental observation also point to the fact that uh, some molecules are strongly strongly adsorbed onto the silica particles whereas some molecules are weakly adsorbed to the silica particles and some some compounds in this case b they are somewhere in between compound a and compound c yeah so something like the adsorption force if you want we can define that way so compound c is strongly adsorbed onto the silica particles that's why it spent a um, relatively higher amount of time in the in the stationary phase whereas molecule a they spent uh, they're weakly adsorbed onto the silica that's why they spent relatively less amount of time in the silica particle or in the stationary phase so what what exactly happens is like uh, if you look at the top of the column once you added acetone it will dissolve it will dissolve the the compound a and then your solution your solvent that carries your analyte it will start to move towards the solid silica particle and your solid your silica particle they are free of your solute molecules so what they will do is like it will start to adsorb it will start to adsorb your analytes say this is just assume this is your silica surface and these are some active spots on the silica surface so once you have your analyte so this is your compound a so so these are free of your analytes so we have some concentration gradient so once we have concentration gradient so naturally your mass will transfer from the solution side to the solid side via diffusion we already talked about uh, this diffusion in previous lectures I, I talked about this fixed first law so it says uh, something like a mass transfer is proportional to concentration gradient so higher the concentration gradient faster will be the rate of mass transfer like your solute will move faster from the liquid side to the solid side via diffusion yeah? and and this one can happen and, and if you imagine we are not agitating the the column we are not adding any extra like we, we didn't add any pump to to force the liquid so so everything happens by naturally via diffusion and the key driving force here is the concentration gradient so what natural what we, what's happening is uh, obviously some adsorption is happening and that adsorption is driven by cons by diffusion and that diffusion is happening that's because we have some driving force and that driving force is nothing but our concentration gradient so i hope you all remember up to this point so this is this is two basics in fact it's a really basic but what you need to understand is is a bit of you just to remember this process but what really happening is like say like at the moment we are dealing with the molecule a so just assume like it can be it can say like this is one silica particle another silica particle another silica particle another silica particle they all have some spots that can absorb your spots or surface surface on the pores surface that bounds the pore so they all can absorb your molecule A. so once you are your eluvent carries your analyte A, it reaches your solid silica particle. You have a concentration gradient, so it will get adsorbed onto one of the, the site and then maybe another site, maybe to the another particle, it will stick onto the another site. 
and so on and, and always remember we are also constantly supplying a fresh eluvent or just a solvent mixture so at the the first process is naturally the adsorption process because you have a concentration gradient and then once this part is exposed to the fresh eluvent which is free of your solute molecule the reverse process will happen which is nothing but a desorption again the same principle we have a concentration gradient this time we have a higher concentration of molecule on the solid side and your solvent is free of your your analyte so the analyte will move from the solid side to your solvent side so what happens is like so your 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 eluvent will carry your analyte from one spot here and then the next and then your pure <laughs> eluvent it it knocks off this the adsorbed analyte and then it will transport to the next silica particle and then this the analyte might spend some time in the next silica particle and then it will be knocked away again and then it will goes to the next silica particle and then it will knock away by the fresh solvent that follows and then it will go to the next silica particle and then it will eventually reach reach the column exit so the time spent by the molecule a in this whole process that defines the retention time retention time and say like if the adsorption is very weak it can be easily knocked away by your solvent particles yeah so that's the that's the main main reason in, in this case we just assume your solvent your sorry your analyte a is weakly adsorbing onto your solid silica particles so so once it gets adsorbed once it meets the next fresh solvent it will be easily knocked away and then it will easily knocked away again this is one reason so so the retention time is very low and another reason can be can be related to the solubility solubility of the compound a say just imagine if compound a is highly soluble highly soluble in the eluvent when compared to compound c if it's highly soluble means they like to stay in the liquid phase because it can easily get dissolved in your solvent so so naturally your solvent can easily knock this this compound due to the solubility factor and then it will it can transport to the next silica particle and then it will go to the next silica particle and it reaches the column exit very quickly so this is one simple observation so based on this we have to put the combine the idea of uh, adsorption phenomena and also the solubility factor so so these are the two things you have to remember in the mind so so that's the one reason why your retention time of one of your molecule is very very high very very low and then retention time of other molecule is very high for the case of say for compound c compound c the same process happens yeah? same process you have silica particles so on and then your your analyte plus eluvent enters the column and then it, it get adsorbed and then you have a strong adsorption yeah so it you need a you, you need a very high concentration of solute to in order to knock this compound from the adsorbed site to the next one and probably your solubility of this compound in the mobile phase may be very very low when you compare with analyte a so that's why it spends extra amount of time in the column so that's why it takes roughly what i mentioned before 90 minutes to reach the column exit so this is the general idea general idea and this is the easiest way to to understand what's really happening in a in a chromatographic column so see if you want to put it simple say like once you added the 
the solvent in this case is mobile phase on the top they will dissolve your compound and the dissolved phase will move through the column so so the dissolved phase will move through the through the column we, where we have our silica particles so once the as the liquid as it flows flows through the through the column this liquid front is always exposed it's always no matter it starts from top to the bottom it's always exposed it's always exposed to the to the silica particles which are free free of your analytes so which means there is a concentration gradient so that's the picture you have to keep think in your mind so the solute will naturally be adsorbed onto the solid surface or, or if you in chemical engineering terms we will call it as some mass is transferred from the mobile phase to the stationary phase via diffusion so keep those things in the in the mind yeah this is a bit tricky to 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 understand but if you think what's really happening if you imagine where the liquid flows from top to the bottom of the column then you will get a clear picture so all you need to remember is that 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 liquid front is always exposed to the fresh silica particles which is free of your analytes and at the same time we are uh, we are also supplying a fresh solvent and from the top of your column so whatever it is already adsorbed onto the silica particle it will be eventually exposed it will be eventually exposed to to your fresh solvent yeah so eventually your solid particles will be when you have a fresh solvent it will your solid particles or analyte particle analyte molecules will be dissolved dissolved from the surface and it then it will eventually move to the mobile phase so the solid particles will move from the stationary phase to the to the mobile phase and if you want i think this is more than enough yeah I don't want to draw one more picture it will take extra time so the retention time the take home message is something like this so the retention time so this is one of the many factor something is related to which is related to retention time is mostly governed by the the series of actions which is adsorption desorption adsorption desorption again adsorption and desorption yeah, so this is governed by this series of action which is uh, happening inside the col column chromatography so why we are learning all these things too slow whatever the things which is happening here like uh, so i said to you if you come back here to this simple diagram or uh, like maybe let me go back here say like if this is a column we have some silica particles with beautiful sites that can adsorb your solute compounds so once it once your analytes are adsorbed onto this site it will immediately establish an equilibrium so something is in solid side something is on the liquid side so and they exist in equilibrium with each other and then the desorption happens and then again you come to an another equilibrium point and then desorption happens and then it can go to another active sites on the same particle or it can go to the another active sites on the next particle and so on so there is a sequence of uh, equilibrium stages if you want you can say like one two three four something like that yeah so so one two three four five six so we are, we are talking about all these factors a bit slowly because this is something related to theoretical plates so we will come back to this later when we are going to talk about a theory of chromatography so obviously there is no plate inside the column but the number of equilibrium stages which is happening inside the the column which also dictate your retention time it's also related to something we call it as the theoretical plates so try to remember this word yeah and also the okay we will come back to that later this theoretical plate like whether it should be very high or whether it should be very low in order to achieve a clear separation and so on so we will cover that later but for the moment what we 
understood is like how to perform the experiment how to add uh, your silica particle we define the different terminologies we know what is stationary phase we know what is a mobile phase we know the the some fancy terminologies eluvent analyte and uh, eluvate eluvate is something that is nothing but a mixture of eluvent plus uh, one of your analyte or more than one of your analytes and then we know the what type of material that we are going to use we are going to, we are using silica but because the silica is a very good adsorbent for most of the molecules and then and it also we can also easily dissolve dissolve the adsorbed molecules from the silica surface using a common solvent or a solvent mixture so these are the the main reasons and then we we learned a bit about uh, something called as a retention time and then i already talked about uh, this retention time is uh, dictated by something some physical process which is nothing but mass transfer and mass transfer is happening due to diffusion and diffusion naturally occurs via a concentration gradient and then in, apart from that if you look into particle by particle then something is happening at, in, at, in the particle surface which is like your your analyte is, is getting adsorbed and it establishes some equilibrium with analytes in the solution phase so this is pure adsorption concept and then these things uh, happen in series because uh, and that and that's happening because uh, your liquid front which carries uh, sorry your your eluvent which carries your analyte this liquid front is always exposed to some pure silica particle and that's why we are some mass is transferring from the liquid side to the solid side and then once adsorption happens the fresh solvent which look at this already adsorbed sites it dissolves these compounds and then it carries to the next particle and the whole process happens in a series so we have a lot of uh, equilibrium stages happening within one column so try to keep those things in the mind and we already know what's on retention time retention time is related to adsorption plus uh, desorption and so on yeah but but this process is not as simple as you think so uh, in this picture all i showed is something like uh, like molecules are going from one spot to another spot another spot to another spot another spot and you will get your concentration concentrated solution here it's not it's not that simple there are few more things that we should remember that we will cover now so keep these things in the mind because when we are going to talk about the theory all these things you should should come still to your your your, your mind yeah because uh, we are going to put some equation it's called van dimter equation so there we have a lot of parameters going on and all those parameters are connected to what we are learning now so some of the parameters are connected to the to the diffusion process some of the parameters are connected to the adsorption equilibrium which is uh, getting established between the particles and the solution side so sorry between the stationary phase and the uh, mobile phase so keep those things in the in the mind and then we already talked a bit about uh, silica particles like uh, their shape their size their porosity process distribution surface area and so on so this van dimter equation will also contain one equation which is directly connected to the properties of your packing material that has nothing to to do with uh, what's the compound that we are going to separate or what's the solvent that we are going to use and so on yeah so keep those things in the in the in the mind If you think this is very difficult to to understand we can even put a simple experiment say like a, say like we have a, say like we have some horizontal column we supply only one molecule of a and then we supply only one molecule of b and then we supply one molecule of c and then let's assume we have some super smart detector at the exit of the column that can i uh, exactly identify the time at which once you once you are you are your single molecule reach the column exit so obviously it's going to get adsorbed onto column a different sorry different particles in the in the column and eventually it reaches to the column exit so just assume we have some some high resolution smart mass spectrophotometer at this side so that will allow you to detect even that one single molecule which is dissolved in the mobile phase whatever the time spent by the molecule we call this as retention time 
So we cannot go to discuss the, we cannot start to discuss about the theories of chromatography unless you don't know what's retention time, unless you don't know what is diffusion, unless if you don't understand adsorption and there is some adsorption equilibrium happening at a different stage. And even for this one single molecule that we are dealing with the moment, it will also go through some sequence of adsorption desorption stages like one in the first particle, second particle, third particle and so on. Yeah. So keep these things in the in your mind. So that's how the retention time works. Obviously in real world nobody is going to, to work with one single molecule. Yeah? If you have one single molecule in a solution if we call it as infinite dilution we cannot dilute more than that but obviously we will we will deal with at least a 10 to the power of 23 molecules yeah? that's nothing but your Avogadro number <coughs> I think this is okay so far not so bad I think until now